Greetings, I have just refurbished this Fostex Multitracker XR7. Later in the video I'll show you the teardown footage, but first I'll take the opportunity to give you brief review and features overview of the unit. So where does this sit amid the variety of multi-track cassette recorders that you can buy in the second-hand market? If you've seen my other videos, you'll know that I analyse that kind of thing according to five key factors, first of which being size and weight. This is quite a light and compact unit considering how many features it has. It's slightly smaller and lighter than a Tascam 44 Mark III, which I suppose is the most obvious competitor it had. It's actually more complex and about the same size as a Yamaha MT4X. A little bit too big to fit into a backpack, but if you had an appropriate case, you'd get it on public transport, no problem. It is dual speed. It's not completely obvious that it's dual speed. What you have to do, press the rehearsal and stop button simultaneously. That means that the rehearsal light here on this backlit LCD display will flash. And that gives you the lower of the two tape speeds that most of these sorts of contraptions conform to. 4.8 centimeters per second or 1 and 7 8 inches per second. Press rehearsal again and you're in 9.5 centimeters per second or 3 and 3 quarter inches per second. That's double the speed of something like a Walkman or a home stereo cassette player. That gives you better fidelity through lower noise floor and better reproduction of high frequencies at the expense of running through the tapes twice as fast. The noise reduction offered is Dolby. Dolby is a playback only system unlike DBX. It's possible to record all four tracks on this unit simultaneously, either in a direct mode where mixer channel one is routed to tape track one, mixer channel three is routed to tape track three, etc. Or in a bust mode where the pan controls direct the mixer channels to the tape tracks. That allows us to do things like mix six drum microphones in a stereo pair, which is recorded to two tracks, leaving another two tape tracks open for overdubs, that kind of thing. In addition to having that flexible six channel mixer, the routing is laid out in such a way that we can bounce, do ping pong recording, take up to three mono tracks, make a blend of them on a fourth track, dub over the material that we just blended and this way build up an arrangement with more than four individual strands. We have auxiliary sends on a per channel basis. These can be sent either to an auxiliary send one or two by turning to the left or right of a center position on these pots. So you could send your effects to an echo or a delay but not both units at the same time. The auxiliary returns are stereo meaning that if you have the sort of outboard effect, such as delays with a ping pong mode, you can send a mono signal into it, but receive a stereo wet signal back. The level of the two auxiliary returns are controllable independently, as are the send levels. The first four mixer channels in monitoring and mixing mode will be used to play back tape tracks one, two, three, four. All include a high and low shelving EQ. In addition to that, channels five and six above them have a three band EQ that includes a sweepable parametric mid-range equalizer. Switches above here mean that we can apply that mixer selection either to these individual tracks, meaning that you could EQ a reverb during mix down. We can assign these mixer channels to tape tracks meaning that we could apply mid-EQ while we're tracking, but it also means we can apply this three-band EQ to an entire mix at the bus level. We have separate fallback out, stereo out, and monitor out. The monitor output, which is also what we hear from the headphone socket, can be switched between fullback bus, stereo bus, or both. Fullback conveniently allows you to keep what you, the performer, hears and what the tape player hears separate. These are dual direction knobs with a notch in the center, so you turn them that way to hear what's coming from tape, or turn them to the left to hear what's coming from the corresponding mixer input. And we do have individual tape outs. That makes it convenient to capture four discrete stem files into your digital audio workstation or other external recorder and do your mix down in the digital domain or with a more complicated desk. We have a return to zero button on the transport, digital counter, backlit meters, a user pitch control which can only be used in the higher of the two tape speeds, and the rehearsal mode which means that what you hear in your headphone switches between what was on tape and what you plan to replace it with without actually recording over the material. So the digital controls are a bit less sophisticated and flexible than what you'd get in a Tascam 44 Mark III, but all the basic stuff is there. I very much like the fact that all the input sockets are easily accessible. There's nothing really tucked around the back apart from the input for the external DC adapter. And when you're sitting in front of it, these input sockets, a punch and out socket for a foot switch and your headphone socket are easy to see as well. 
There was no horrible surprises for me or very dubious design decisions in here when I opened it up. I would like to have the pitch control in the lower tape speed as well. And again, comparing it to a 424 Mark III, I suppose I would miss the per channel mid-range EQ. But it's a pretty satisfactory unit to use. If something like a 424 Mark III wasn't available or something like this was available at a better condition or a better price, Definitely a very good unit. Fostex multi-trackers tend to fetch less money than Tascams, so you're probably going to get good value for money buying one of these in the second-hand market. I've begun to tear down the XR7 now. Most of these are going to lift out pretty easily. You might need a spudging tool. Maybe you could use a plectrum or something to lift up the likes of these. Input select switches, the record select switches. Likewise, these switches at the top. I've left in these rows just so we can know which colour goes where. So EQ seems to be grey. Shift is this dark blue. The auxiliary is green. Pan is the same colour of grey as the EQs. Trim's orange. Auxiliary sends are red. Green for the auxiliary returns. And the monitor control is grey. I neglected to talk about the colour of the knobs that were in these four channels. So the auxiliary is green. High and low EQ is grey pan is red and full black is orange. This pitch control could be pretty difficult to get out before I actually remove the electronics from the case. Most of this video is shot in sequence but this is uh, me coming back to you from the future. As I remove the screws from this build I'm going to be commenting on screw type. It's just going to be oh this is the colour of it, how much thread is on it. A detail that I'm not including as I tear down which I want you to notice for yourself as you tear down your unit is the length of the screws because there are slightly different lengths like this group here and this group here are identical but these are slightly longer by about two or three millimeters and then we've got these ones that look identical except again we've got a short version and a longer version so in addition to any thing I'm saying about this is where the screws are this is what the head looks like as you take them out please notice whether they're shorter or longer and uh, group them accordingly uh, sorry that the instructions aren't more detailed than they are off screen there I've removed nine screws from nine holes one two three four five six here those contain longer screws like this you have a thread on them up about two thirds of the way and then these three along here contain a shorter screw that's threaded over its entire length. The case will then come apart. What you're first going to see is that the two halves are connected by three ribbon cables at this side and a thinner white data cable on the left. I'm going to recommend that you don't detach these if you possibly can. Possibly this is a better sort of ribbon cable on the Fostex, but I've had Yamaha and Tascam units where once they're out, they're pretty difficult to put back in. So I'm going to try and have it hinge along this right hand side and open up like a book. As long as you pull this white data cable quite straight, then it will just come out pretty easily like that. That way. I can fold this open like that. I'm going to focus on getting the cassette player out first of all. So let's lift this shielding up. The way that connected, pin and slot connection. So that came from ground two, just in the bottom left of this board here. You'll notice that the part with the plastic attached is on top. That's, I suppose, so the PCB there doesn't short out against this. To be able to get this cassette player, change the belts and so on, it looks like I'm going to need to remove this display. And that seems to be attached to this board via this ribbon cable. Well, I'll get this board up first. Metal cable tidy with another screw just in here. So that's the sort of screws that we have going into plastic mounting posts. There's four screws visible holding this down. The two screws that came from that side were the same as the kind that we removed from this board. The two from this side a double dome top so I'm able to disconnect the wires going to the transport from this header here marked as P902 and then the connections to the motor and beside it that's P901 we may as well disconnect this completely if we can I can't see the number for this connector but it's Beside this blue component here and number four, which I assume is just for the track numbers. Oh no, they are numbers for the sockets. 
Uh, so this is number seven, I'm going to disconnecting. I think these all have different numbers of pins, but maybe not. What I'm going to do as a precaution is take some coloured Sharpies and match the colour of the header to the connector. This one came from there, so I'll put a bit of bits of plastic. This one up here, black on both. So perhaps you want to take the same precaution if you're disassembling one of these yourself. Sockets number one, five and six here are soldered in. The connections are at this end. Oh no, it does disconnect at that end. So I'll colour them at this end. That might not have been a very satisfactory step-by-step -step <laughs> guide to unplugging those cables. But if you go through this method of colour coding them, you'll be able to figure out what just happened there. Take your own photos as you go along, you'll be fine. We've got this large metal plate here, which I suppose is mainly acting as shielding between the magnetic heads and the motor. And all the circuitry to do with the LED display. An interplastic type of screw in that corner there. There's another one just below the heads here. And finally, there's one that's going through a common ground ring connector in this corner. That ring connector is two ended, the other end of it is in the top right corner of the cassette player. The way that I describe common ground connectors like that, which somebody with a really good electrical engineering background might scoff at, is all your electrons in the various circuits that make up your port studio or whatever, they all want to go to die in the same place. And it's going to be called common ground, circuit ground, chassis ground. Those things are roughly equivalent, but basically all the largest areas of metal in a unit like this are all going to be connected. And that includes things like shielding, things like the housing of the motor, and the cassette player, and also the largest green areas of uh, all of the circuit boards. It should all join together so that the electrons that we can conceptualise is going through little journeys around these systems, around this big city of electrical routes, all sort of die in the same place. In order to make that happen, you know, you'll often find common ground connectors, I call them ring connectors, that join the largest pieces of metal. If these things don't join up, then what you can have is basically there's more than one place that an electron can go to die, or an electron can't quite die, so things that should drain away harmlessly to common ground, like hum from the motor, ripple from the DC supply, these things end up in your audio path. So if you've got nasty buzzing and humming, then the first thing to look for is something like this that hasn't been connected following a belt change or similar. I'm going to write an E there just to remind myself that there is a common ground earth connector there. I think the only electrical connections that we've got from the transport to this record playback board now are the connections from the record play and erase heads here. So it seems like the corresponding segment of the record play and the erase head will be sharing a single header and these are colour coded. Looking at the reference number for the components, I think this is one, two, three, four. It's a slightly different colour coded scheme to Tascam. If you're kind of slow and gentle, I think that's just going to come out without damaging the wires. And in this case, the connectors and headers are the same colour of plastic, so there's no need to do any colour coding of our own. As so far as I can see, we've got one, two, three screws holding this in place. And both this corner and this corner, we have those common ground connectors. So in advance of taking those screws out, I'll just put ease there to remind myself that those need to be reconnected. DBL for double to remind myself that this two-ended ring connector is going to go in that corner and it's going down to that shielding. So at that point, it's going to be removed completely. I mean, it's not dissimilar cassette player to what you'd see in units, which I assume are contemporaries of this 424 Mark II, MT4X, that kind of thing. The difference being that on those models, you would have a rear facing capstan motor placed here. But yeah, it's a two belt system, single motor, capstan belt turning this flywheel. And then the momentum from that is passed to the real mechanism via a square section belt here. And a pair of solenoids is controlling you know, cams, levers, gears, which will allow the momentum, again, coming from the single motor via the flywheel, to raise and lower the heads and the pinch roller arm, depending whether you're in stop, play, pause, and pause mode for this 
assembly is going to be the same thing as fast forward and rewind because basically the the pinch roll and the heads will pull down slightly not enough that you can remove the cassette player but enough so that the pinch roller isn't pressing the tape between it and the capstan so that only the turning of these real tables draws the tape forward or backwards the motor here is this Sankyo SHU-2R. I found that you can directly substitute these with the Mabuchi motors. You get in Tascams, uh, they operate in the same way. You know, it's like plus and minus voltage in this pair. And then it's marked HL, but really there's a resistance between those two points. And the higher it is, the faster this will turn, uh, which sounds counterintuitive. You'd expect it to be the other way because of Wilms Law, but um, it isn't. So uh, if you couldn't get hold of that model of motor, if you had a motor problem, if you can get hold of a Mabuchi, it's an EKY32D or something. Anyway, it's one of the ones with four pins. I'll put the correct serial number up on the screen. As long as it's a forward facing motor, you could just drop that in, wire those four cables to the corresponding four tabs on that style of motor and it would work. One of the common things you'd want to do if you're going to refurbish one of these is change the rubber belts, change or at least clean the pinch roller. The pinch roller is pretty simple on this, we would just get something like a small flat head screwdriver, sort of jam it into the space between the bottom of the pinch roller and this plastic pinch roller arm and it's just going to pop out. You can see there's a little bit of shine there on the surface but it's basically okay. I haven't really found any bad pinch rollers from this generation in the 90s yet, so they seem to still be within their shelf life. Probably what I'll do is put that into a little tin I've got of MG Chemicals Rubber Renew, wiggle it about and then just rub all the dirt off onto a paper towel and reinstall it. But you can get replacements for these if you look around on AliExpress and so on. There's quite a lot of places out in the Far East. I say the Far East. Not very far if you're already in the East. But for me in Scotland, it's the Far East. Uh, but yeah, you, you could get a replacement. But I'll probably just clean that. To get at the two belts, we're going to need to remove four screws. Two on this side, two on this side. I think it's the only place in this build where I'm going to use a slightly smaller size of screwdriver. Notice that the one that's going directly into the metal, as opposed to through this black cassette retaining clip, has a washer on it. That'll go the same for the other side as well. With all four of those screws and both of those black plastic clips removed, this will just come off like that. There are little tabs and here that slot into holes on this lip of the cassette player. Looking at the condition of this, see it's got a few kinks in it. It feels quite dry and inflexible, so I will want to replace that. I mean, it probably wouldn't deteriorate into tar for several years, many years to come even, but it's feeling a bit dry. And then the belt that transfers the energy from the flywheel to the real mechanism here, um, that's slipping into a black plastic recess on the underside of this flywheel and going to a corresponding recess on this little wheel here. Imagining you needed to desolder something, resolder something, change some components, I don't know, repair. These boards, let's figure out how they're removed. Here we have the power socket and the power switch on this little board. Two screws here, going into plastic mounting posts, so very similar to screws that we saw earlier. So we've got one diode there, I presume that's protection against putting the wrong polarity of voltage into there. This takes positive tip as opposed to the negative tip which is accepted by Tascams. And the resistor, there are really not many components on there at all. It's going into connector number three on this board here. As I mentioned earlier, I'm going to leave these ribbon connectors in place. I don't trust them to go back in if I remove them. I can see one, two, three, four screws holding this board onto the case here. They're of this double dome type, but otherwise pretty much interchangeable with the kind that we just removed from that board. That's going to lift up, but it's attached to shielding beneath by another one of these pin and socket connectors. That's ground one beside ribbon connector two in the bottom left corner of this board. 
the shielding is pretty much glued down so I won't lift it but the plastic case is now detached I switch this around and fold this over like a book so those ribbon cables are still attached maybe to begin with I'll focus on removing this board which must have the record arms, which is the cassette shuttle controls and years of pitch control on it. I'll remove that from the plastic case here. It looks like we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight screws there. It removes all the screws now. That's what they look like. They're a little bit longer than some of the other ones, but they are of this type where there is a shallow angle between the threads, more than half a millimetre anyway, between the threads. If you were feeling really fastidious, you could keep screws for this board in a little uh, you know plastic zip bag and then either use an elastic band to attach it to that board so you know that all those screws pertain to that or you could attach the bag to it with masking tape or something i sometimes do that on a really complicated build but this build is simple enough i'm just going to rely on memory or if necessary looking back at this footage so there's a few switches there that will probably need cleaning here's the user pitch control if that gets too dusty then you can get slightly weird behavior from the tape speed the shuttle buttons are on an array here and we could treat that with peroxide and uv light or you know just put it in a window cell brighten those up if they were very brown not too bad on this unit and like I mentioned ages ago, now finally the user pitch control is going to fall out. Well, we're thinking about plastic bits and pieces. We could take the door out, remove one of those three screws here and the only screw on that one. Same kinds of screws as before. And that will come away as a unit. Looks like uh, actually these are the same kinds of screws as well, but it's keeping this spring up against this rigid plate. Both of these rigid plates are actually the same part. I just I just turned the case door like that. When we reinstall the door we want this triangular pin by my finger here to fit between solid plate and the springy one and that's what stops the door from just falling shut again when you lift it open. Supposing we had a problem with any of these sockets and we wanted to get out for that reason or if you're doing this the way I am which is not to disconnect these ribbon cables then you would have to remove this metal part with the sockets attached to it in order to get at this for cleaning or repair. So I'll remove that. We've got three of these double domed screws along here. As far as I can see every other screw that's attaching either this metal part to the plastic case or this mixer board to the plastic case are the same. I will come back and correct myself if I'm wrong about any of that. Those screws are one, two, three, four going through the metal. Then we've got one, two, three, four in a sort of skew if row like that. One by itself beside this sort of semicircular indent. One, two, three, four, five in a sort of zigzag where those two ribbon cables go in and, and two beside the input sockets at the front here. Notice that these holes, which are through holes for plastic posts that hold the two halves of the case together, have a white ring around them, so we don't want to put screws back in there when we reassemble. Put DB for double-headed oh, beside these three holes to remind myself that it's the double-headed ones that go in there. I've also noticed that there is a little bit of plastic shielding. I assume that's to prevent any crosstalk between this part of the circuit and any signals that are on this ribbon cable. So on that clear bit of plastic shielding I've written up to show that it's this side up. There's maybe a screw there that I didn't point out earlier. I've also drawn uh, the outline of the shielding and put SH for shielding. So these are just like little notes to help me remember how to assemble it later on. With all of those screws removed, tip at the front slightly because we have these input sockets protruding into these apertures. Another pin and socket connector here connecting this bit of shielding here to what would be the bottom left corner of the mixer. Then these bits of metal shielding over the pots, there's a double-ended ring connector connecting both of those and a single-ended one going to a pin and socket connector here. And that gives us access to all the pots and switches. I've got this side on 
type of faders here when we get access to these switch covers. Now this unit's not too bad, it's probably just needing cleaned really, but if I were going to be doing any soldering or anything, I would be trying to keep all these held together with ribbon cables in one unit like this. I just don't trust these to go back into the connectors. Um, if you are braver than me, then there's like a plastic bit that you lift off there and that pulls out. You push it in perfectly straight and put the plastic part back, essentially. This uh, cardboard with these sort of felt slits for the faders, the stuff does getting into them, that would come off. But again, this is a kind of connector that in the past when I've tried to lift these little metal clips that are holding them onto plastic posts. If you try and pry them out with a screwdriver, sometimes you'll bend them, sometimes the little plastic post to which they're attached will snap. It's more trouble than it's worth, basically. I would, you know, as in this case where there's quite a lot of dust on the felt protector, I would try and just blow that out with the compressed air. Any cleaning of the plastic, I would just, you know, just try to keep any liquids away from this where it might soak. That's a, an easier compromise than trying to remove these connectors, in my opinion. As regards calibration, focusing on the main things you'd want to calibrate on the record playback board, which confusingly isn't what I'm showing you just now, it's Trimpot's V101 through 104 that you use to set the gain of the playback amplifiers. It's V201 through 204 that you use to set the gain of the record amplifiers. The pitch of the tape player at the centre notch of the user pitch control. And six trim pots pertaining to setting the calibration of the meters. The trim pots for those are actually set in the back of the LCD screen module that we looked at earlier, but they're accessible through holes through the bottom of the case, which is what we're looking at just now. Thank you. 